uh, CJ asked me to preach on prayer, and you're doing this series on prayer. And so I dug in. If you've got a Bible, Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be. I'm gonna, we're going to kind of unpack a few verses in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus actually teaches about prayer, he, which, is, which is fascinating. He sits his disciples down, and, he, and he's going to teach them the Lord's Prayer, which I'm not going to cover. But before he teaches them the Lord's Prayer... He says, uh, I'm going to teach you how to pray, which is just fascinating. So if you're in Matthew chapter 6, it's in verse 5, it says, and when you pray, he, already, he starts off, he is, first off, he assumes that you're going to pray. That, and I, and I uh, planted a church in Vancouver a bunch of years ago, and in kind of West Coast progressive thinking culture, people pray. This isn't weird for people to pray, what you need to clarify is what prayer even is because what they pray is they pray to like themselves or the divine spark in them or like the new age movement, like they pray to the universe, you know, and the universe, uh, you know, is gonna give them back what they want. So it's called the law of attraction. So most people I knew would go, oh yeah, I pray. You know, if I want money, I just go like money, 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 and then more money comes. If I want health, I just say I'm healthy, I'm healthy. And if you want a boat, you just put a picture of a boat on the fridge, you go boat, 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 boat. And then the universe has to respond and give you a boat and money and health and whatever. And that's called the law of attraction. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about praying to God, the God of the universe, the God of love, the God that created everything. And he wants us to pray. But it's fascinating because it's when you pray and he starts to teach his disciples how to pray, which is fascinating because I remember reading um, a year or so ago this, this quote I saw online and it stuck with me. And, and, and it said this, Jesus taught his disciples not to preach, but to pray. Fascinating. He didn't teach his disciples how to preach. He taught them to pray. And that was super convicting for a guy who literally has a preaching course. All right, I teach preaching to preachers and it's an online course that pastors buy and they're like, and they're like oh, let me teach you the techniques of preaching and da, da, da. So if you bought that course, you can return it. All right, I'm sorry, because Jesus said, I'm not teaching people how to preach. I'm teaching people how to pray. And the reason that's the case is because I will tell you after 20 years of ministry and pastoring, it is easier for me to preach a 30 minute sermon than it is for me to pray for 30 minutes, right? It is easier. I just spoke at um, Indiana Wesleyan University on Friday night. They have a huge like gathering of youth, 2,000 youth in the room, worshiping Jesus, so amazing to see. And I preached there in the morning and I preached there at night, uh, preaching here all weekend. That's like three or four hours of preaching collectively. I can't tell you when the last time it was I prayed for three or four hours over the course of a weekend. Because here's the, here's the crazy thing. I've probably preached uh, a lot of bad sermons in my life, but I, I've never, here's the thing, I've never forgot that I was preaching when I was preaching, right? Like, it's never been, like, I've never been up here and been like, oh, shoot, where'd you guys come from? Okay, oh, yeah, right, right, I'm up here, I'm preaching right now. Hello, how are you? It's never happened, but with praying, I have been in the presence of the God of the universe and been like, Father, I just, I just pray for, for Joanne here, and I just, Lord, I just hope that everything goes good. And am I supposed to pick up tomatoes today from the grocery store or potatoes? Did she say tomatoes or potatoes? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. So Lord, I just, I just, I pray for her and I pray for these things in her life and I pray for this guy that he, that he gets saved. I'm just supposed to pick up the youngest kid from skating or not skate. I don't know what the, is it baseball? I don't know what's going on here. What? And this is, this is what happens. We, we I just, I or I just fall asleep when I'm praying, right? It's like you forget, none of that has ever happened when I'm preaching. And so this is what happens is Jesus goes, I actually need to teach you to pray because can we admit it's actually kind of hard, right? Because of all the distraction, right? The minute you start to pray after like two minutes, especially this generation, it's like, oh man, what's going on on Insta? And you scroll, you're like, all right. And you're given seven hours to scrolling and you're like, okay, I gotta pray for two minutes. I gave two minutes to the Lord. Okay, I'm good to go. And what's happening over here? So Jesus is like, we gotta be super intentional about this. And here's what I love about it. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. I love that because he's saying religion, hypocrites was a word that was used for people who acted on the outside as if they knew God, but really internally they didn't really walk with the God of the universe. They pretended, they, they act religious. They acted like their prayers were great in the religious life. But when they were in the dark, when no one was looking, they didn't actually love and walk 
with God. And so he's warning, he's going, prayer is connected to not being religious type people, not being the kind of people that would come to church. Because some of you, this is your, your issue. I wasn't raised in the church, but some of you were raised in the church and you were taught to be good religious boys and girls. So if you, you know, say these words and don't say these words, you don't watch rated R movies, you don't do these things, you don't do this, you don't smoke, you don't do this. And then all those things, you got that sorted out, then God will love you. That's how many of you grew up thinking. And the reality is Jesus goes, be very careful. Don't be like a hypocrite who externally on the outside does all the religious stuff, but doesn't actually love and walk and treasure the God of the universe. Because what'll happen is you can be born in the church, serve in the church, get married in the church, have your funeral in the church and still wake up in hell. Because you didn't actually walk and know and love Jesus. You just did all the religion. You were a good religious boy or girl, and you look the part. And that's, Jesus is terrified about people like that because he comes along and says, no, 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 guys, that's not what it is now. Religion is over. Religion is shut down. I'm bringing in a new day and I'm bringing in relationship versus the rules that used to guard your life. And so I always think about um, the, the weekend that my wife actually went on a trip with her girlfriends. And uh, so I have three daughters, okay, 17, 15 and 13, so I'm a girl dad, so I have four mothers at home, and they tell me what to do, and they take care of me all the time. Uh, and so, um, so I have these, uh, my wife goes away for a weekend, and my youngest, we were getting, I remember we were getting in the van, and she's like, hey dad, can I make hot chocolate? And I'm like, absolutely not, that goes wrong every single time. You're gonna spill it on the carpet, like you just don't know how to do hot chocolate. And she's like, come on dad. Just like, I said, no, absolutely not. So I went and took a shower, I come downstairs, I walk back in the kitchen, and she's, I can see the powder on the, on the counter, and I'm like, this girl has, has made hot chocolate. So I like go in there, and I'm like, what's going on? I go, I'm like, what? And I'm hearing on the front door, waiting to get in the van, and I'm hearing them, and then all of a sudden I hear right? And I'm like, oh gosh. And I go out, and there's of course hot chocolate all over the carpet of my house. And I'm like, what? What are you? So I go into like, you know, I'm an 80s, like I go in the 80s dad, right? Because I grew up in the 80s. So I, I just got like I don't I don't do any of this, like, oh I, I see how you feel. All right, I know. <laughs> Yeah, I know who you are. I get it, right? That's not who I am, all right? I see the personality profile. Mm -hmm. I like go into, I go into 80s, dad. I'm like, do you don't understand? Life's gonna beat you up. You're gonna figure this out. You're gonna be a woman. Life doesn't give you rails. You better earn it, kid. All right, I go into that mode. And then I get a text from my wife and it just says, remember relationship over rules, right? And I realize one of these morons has texted my wife while she's out with her friends and told them that I'm getting mad at my kid. Now, but, but, that text always stuck with me because it was relationship over rules. It was saying, you gotta make sure your relationship with your kid, there, there's a time when your kid is young and it's like rules, it's boundaries, it's don't do this and don't touch that and don't say this. But then there comes a point where it's relationship and that's the influence that you have. And the kid, you begin to have a relationship. This is what Jesus is saying. There was an Old Testament time of religion when sacred land mattered and there was these temples and there was these uh, sacrifices and certain days that you would do all these sacred things. But Jesus says, I have come and in the cross and the resurrection, that time is over. That has now given way to relationship and grace in an organic walk with the God of the universe where you're not in sacred temples. God doesn't live in sacred houses anymore. He now lives in people and this whole era of salvation has changed and dawned a new world. It's a beautiful message that Jesus comes. He says, the end of religion, it's over. My, uh, there's a guy that I know back in Toronto. He has this um, tattoo on his arm, okay? And it's, it's literally, it says the word Leviticus. 1928, a massive black shaded in tattoo. It covers the whole length of his arm. Leviticus 1928. And of course, people walk up to him and they say, what does that verse say? And here's what Leviticus 1928 says. Do not put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. <laughs> right? Because there was a time and where that was the thing. It was like, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. God was like, hey, I don't want you putting tattoo marks because you're marking yourself up for the dead, Old Testament. But now Jesus is saying, hey, 
The kingdom of God belongs to everybody. It belongs to every Gentile. That these rules don't apply anymore, which is really good because your whole worship team would have to be fired if there was this that was legitimate. All right, they got tattoos. They're like, nah, nah, nah. like <laughs> Jesus is like, hey, by the way, tattoos, what are we talking about, right? And so this is beautiful because this sets us up to go religion is over. And so you don't have to pretend you have a prayer life anymore. That's what he's saying. Be careful of the hypocrites. You gotta be careful of playing. You gotta make sure who are you in the dark when nobody's looking? That's the question. Not who are you at church? Not who are you at youth group? Not who are you when you act like a Christian and you say, you know, you just, you know, you never swear. You've never said a swear word in your life except for the Christian swear words. Like, oh, mung pie or whatever. And you're like, oh, see, I'm a good Christian. I've never said this word. I don't say these things. And God's going, no, no, no. You never swear, but you don't love me. She's like, I don't swear, mama. (laughs) So um, Jesus is teaching and he's trying to show them it's not about the hypocrisy of your life. Now, here's the beautiful part. Some of us, the reason we're hypocrites, the reason we play act is because we believe that we're not good enough for God to ever use us or answer our prayers. We think we're the kind of people, maybe you walked in here and you're like, yeah, God, I mean, Pastor Mark, I mean, you don't, you don't even know me, man. You don't, I've messed up my, I've, you don't know what I looked at last week. You don't know the way I've messed up my family, my money. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've messed my life. God, I mean, God would never answer prayers of someone like me. And I'm here to tell you that I'm the poster boy for that reality. God should never, God answers my prayers, guys. And I'm telling you, he shouldn't, because I'm a mess. I'm a disaster. I am a, I am a wreck. I am sinful, I do things for just me. I, 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 this is my life. And I know some of you, oh, no, no, pastors. And listen, the mistakes that I have made in my life, in my ministry, God should have stopped answering my prayers a long time ago. Well, I told you guys last time I was here about the woman that I told her her husband was dead and I had the wrong guy. Remember that last year, right? That's crazy. I told a woman that her husband was dead. He's dead, he's gone. And I mourned the death of her husband for an hour with her. And I had the wrong guy. God should have just stopped answering my prayers right there. Listen, I had a, I had a new church or 150 people at my church plant in Vancouver. And I walked in, we were in a very uh, kind of Asian Chinese community. And I was like, hey, bro, I need you to start. There was this guy at the back. I said, you'd be awesome. I need you to start a Chinese speaking community group. You're gonna kill it. We gotta reach the Chinese people all around our campus. He's like, yeah, that's a really good idea, Mark. Uh, but I'm Korean. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm just saying you'd be really good at it, man. What are you talking about? I obviously know. This is who God uses, all right? This this mistake-ridden, like even, okay, so last week, okay, okay, I'll give you a a mod. Last week, okay, so uh, you guys ever heard of Saddleback Church? Right, Saddleback, okay, so Saddleback's one of the biggest churches in America, changed American evangelicalism 35 years ago, one of the tens of thousands of people reaching to millions of people online, all this crazy stuff. So I get a phone call a couple weeks ago, a couple couple months ago, hey, do you wanna come preach at Saddleback? I got an invitation to preach at the Pinnacle, man. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Saddleback, yes, absolutely. So I go and I prep, I gotta gotta have everything figured out because I'm going to Saddleback. I gotta make sure everything's legit and honed in and perfect. Saddleback, nice people. So, I get it all zoned in and I get up there and I'm preaching and I'm like, hey, I have this thing where I'm talking about, hey, some of you guys think God can never use you, but do you know the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul, he was a murderer. And I said, how many, raise your hand in this audience if you are a murderer, right? And of course, nobody, nobody does it. Nobody raises their hands. And so I'm sitting there and I get up there at the 11 o'clock service and I'm like, raise your hand if you're a murderer. And I see out of the corner of my eye, this, this hand, this lady's hand goes off. I'm like, oh my gosh, we got a murderer in the house. Uh, that's, you know, thanks for being so real. And I realize it's the sign language lady. <laughs> I've gone, hey, raise your hand up if you're a murderer. And she's like, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> Listen. <laughs> God redeems Stupid. Right? And some of you walked in here and you're like, 
God can never use me. I've made too many mistakes. I've fumbled the ball too many times. God shows up and goes, come on, get up. Pray. I, there's power in this. I want to change. I want to change your life. I want to change what's around you. This is a beautiful thing about what God does. And so listen to verse six. When you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus is saying there's going to be a reward to the prayer. There's a reward to the prayer. Now here's, here's the two rewards. A, it changes you. Okay, first off, it changes you. That's, listen, this is very important. That's the reward. See, uh, go, to, go to verse six. Okay, so listen to this. But when you pray, go into your room, okay? So this word room is the word tamion. And what it literally means, it was not just any room. This is very important. It was not just a random room in your house. Some of you read that and you're like, okay, I'll go into my bedroom, I'll pray, my, my whatever, and that's good. But in the first century, that tamion word didn't mean any random room. It was the treasure room of a house. It was where if you had like, you had like things that a family had passed down, you had gold, you had like silver, you had things that were a treasure and you wanted to lock them away and make sure they were secure, you would put them in the tamion. Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into the, the tamion because here's what he's saying. This is very important. He's saying, go into the room and pray because the prayer is the treasure. That's the treasure. So some of you are looking for results and you're like, well, what if I pray and then this thing happens? He goes, no, 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 hold on, let's, let's move it back. The fact that you're praying is the treasure. That's, that's the beautiful reward you get. See, some of us, we believe in the gospel so that we can go to heaven when we die and see the people that we miss and eat great food and fly around and all the different things that we go, okay, I'll accept Christ now. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. You know what you get when you believe the gospel? You get God. That's the actual treasure. You get God. That should blow your mind. Right? All religion was like, hey, hopefully if I'll be a good person, I can climb my way up. He's going, no, no, no. You actually get God. That's the reward. Because here's the thing. I just want to challenge this with this because some of us walk in here and we believe in Jesus, but we don't treasure him. And the Bible constantly comes at us and goes, listen, just believing in Jesus, that's one thing, but I want you to actually treasure him above all things because here's what you gotta know. Satan believes in Jesus and it doesn't save him. Why? Because he doesn't treasure it above everything else in the universe. He doesn't say that I treasure Jesus Christ above money. I treasure Jesus Christ above my family. I treasure Jesus Christ above my spouse. I treasure Jesus Christ above my reputation and my work and thinking that I'm gonna become successful in the world. That's the thing. Like every time um, I baptize somebody, so I planted a church in Vancouver. We would baptize people out in the Pacific Ocean because we never had a building. Like we would never be able to have a building with nice, warm, like bubbly hot tubs and like, I baptize you in the name of the Father. And I was like, yeah. We would go out. In the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, it'd be 42 degrees Fahrenheit in the water. I'd be wearing a wetsuit so I didn't get hypothermia. There'd be 65 people lined up and we would baptize them. And when they went under that water, it wasn't even a symbol of dying to self. It was like, they felt like they were dying under there. They were like, Aah! and they got back up. But every time we baptized them, I would say the same thing. Do you believe in Jesus as the Lord, the Savior, and the treasure of your life? Because this Jesus, he lived a perfect life in your place. He died on a cross. He rose again. And the reason you treasure him is because he's not dead, guys. He is alive. Some of us think about Jesus as if he's some like peasant guy. Like whenever we think, whenever you pray to Jesus, whenever you worship Jesus, whenever you think about Jesus, most of the pictures in your mind are he's a peasant and he's walking around in Palestine in the first century and he's talking to people and he's all dusty. And then the Romans killed him and he's a victim in your brain. But the Bible says, no, 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 guys, that's who Jesus was for 30 years, 2000 years ago. It's not who he is now. Who he is now is reigning and ruling at the right hand of the Father over everything that happens, and he's coming back for his church one day. I remember I had this uh, old pastor, he was 75 years old, he brought a bunch of us preachers in a room. He's like, hey, listen, let me ask you a question. 
He goes, um, if you work on your sermon all week long and you show up to church and not one person from your church actually shows up, like if I got to Northview this morning and none of you came, all right, you just stayed home, you're like, ah, there's a fill-in, we're gonna stay home, where's CJ, all right? So you found out someone was filling in, like, you know, two people told me after the last service, like, ah, we got here and we're like, oh, there's a fill-in. Yeah, I'm like, thank you, you're very welcoming here in Indianapolis. Uh, so, so you found out there's a fill-in and you just show up, nobody, Belky, everybody's empty. He goes, what would you do? And us pastors, we just sat there in dead silence and looked at him and said, I don't know, go home, go pray somewhere, do something righteous. He goes, no, no, no. You still get up and you preach that sermon. And he said, I'll tell you why. Because it's not only people that need to be reminded. There are principalities and powers in existence in that room that need to be told that in Jesus Christ, they are defeated that they are done and that Jesus is reigning and ruling and coming back again. They're alive in this room right now, trying to distract you. You're coming in and out of con. You're like, eh, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Who's doing prayer? <laughs> you got voices, you got distraction. You can't even hold on for 35 minutes. Why? There are, there's, there are forces in this universe that don't want you to give your life to Jesus or live for him or treasure him at all. And that's why when my kids were little, they would have nightmares and they'd say, daddy, daddy, there's monsters in my room. And the one thing I would never do is lie to them and tell them that there's no such thing as monsters. What I would say is you gotta love Jesus, the monster slayer. You gotta trust in him because there are forces and realities that wanna distract you. And, and so Jesus is going, guys, the one great treasure of your life needs to be God. More than money, more than reputation, more than success. And he's looking at these people and he's saying, listen, I need you to pray. I need you to pray, it'll change your life. And you can't be a hypocrite, don't pretend. I remember in college, uh, my, I, I got to Bible college, I was like 19 or 20 years old and my buddy, called me up, he's like, hey, there's a television show that wants us to go on the TV shows in Toronto, Christian TV show, national syndicated show, and they want us to come on. And I said, great, love it, let's go. And I said, what, what's the topic? And he said, prayer, we gotta go talk about prayer. And I'm like, okay, uh, I don't really, okay, yeah, I'll be there. And I didn't really know what, so I just started reading books. And I read this one book and it said, prayer is not only talking, but it's listening. Listen, so I was like, oh, that's a really good line. I'm gonna use that on the TV show. So we get in the car, we start to drive, and my buddy's like, hey, what are you gonna, what are you gonna say? And I said, oh, I'm gonna say, prayer's not only talking, but it's listening. And he's like, yeah, that's really good. I said, what are you gonna say? He's like, I don't really know. So we get there, we put the makeup on, we get in our chairs, the lights come on, the cameras come on, the host comes on. Hey, everybody, we're talking got these guests today. We're talking about prayer. What do you think? She looks at my buddy. She's like, what do you think? And he looks at the camera, he goes, I, I think prayer's not only talking, but listening, all right? And I'm like, what the? I almost killed him right there on television. I'm like, what the? What are you doing? And he's like, and you can see in the video, his eyes dart right to me. He's like, I got a prayer. Prayer's not only talking. And he's like, and I'm like, what? And then they looked at me and they're like, oh, that was really deep. That was super existential, Kierkegaardian. Oh, that was very hermeneutically correct and ecclesiological. And I look at me and like, what do you think? I'm like, uh -huh. And I literally, I didn't even know. I just strung a bunch of words together, like word salad. I was like, I don't know, consequences, prayer with coincidences that happen with consequences, rain, consequences, mustard. I don't know. And then they're like, wow, that was interesting. We'll be back. What was that? And I just left. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> How sick is it that I had to pretend I had a prayer life? I was so emptied of myself, I had nothing to share about prayer when a guy stole one line from me. And this is what Jesus doesn't want for your life. He's like, don't end up in the situation of hypocrites. You gotta go into your room, you gotta be somebody in, in, in the dark, when nobody else is looking that loves to connect to the Father because it changes you, and that's a beautiful thing. Now, verse, uh, verse uh, six, uh, verse seven, look at, look at the next verse. It says, um, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because there are many words. Next verse, do not be like them, for the, fa I love this, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Here's what's beautiful about this. That means you can pray whatever you want because while you have power in prayer, you don't have ultimate power in prayer. 
Don't worry. You can say anything to God. Some of you are so, you're so nervous. You're so conservative. I don't want to say this long thing. What if I, and so you pray in King James and you do it all formally and you're like, thou father, I love thy, and I shall walketh with the Lord. And you're like, you got to go all formalized. And this, he's going, no, no, the father already knows, man. He's so powerful. He's not going to give you so much power that you get whatever you want. That's the beautiful thing about God. It's, it's, have you ever heard that Garth Brooks song, Unanswered Prayers? You ever heard that, like old country song? Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers, right? It's gonna be in your head now. So, so he, he talks about the idea that thank God that he, he didn't answer every single prayer that I had in life or my life wouldn't have turned out. And it's like some of you, you know, when you were in high school, right, or junior high, you had that one girl that you wanted to marry and you were like, oh, please, Lord, let me marry Sally. She's so cute and little pigtails and I'll do anything. I'll serve you in Saudi Arabia if you just give me <laughs> Sally. Let me, let me, let me please Lord Jesus, please give me Sally. She's so cute and beautiful. Sally, give me Sally. And then, and then, and then his answer to that was no. And you married somebody else. You went to high school and college. You found someone you married. And you live a great, and you went on Facebook two years ago and you saw Sally and you're like, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for not answering my prayer. Right? That's like, that's our life, man. Imagine God answered every prayer that you prayed. That's not how it works. And it's a good thing it doesn't because it's the Father knows. You don't know. You aren't all knowing. You don't know if your prayer should. Be. And so the beautiful thing is the Father knows, which means you can be super raw with him. You can be super authentic. You can pray whatever you want. You ever, you ever been reading the Psalms and you like read these Psalms and David, one, one minute he's like, oh, I'm just... I'm so thankful to be in the house of the Lord and I love the courts of the Lord. And Lord, I just want to bless you. And literally the next Psalm is like, Lord, I hate my enemies. I hope they all die and suffer and their teeth get knocked out by rocks and their children suffer too. And you're like, wow, bad day. What the? <laughs> Have you ever read those? Those prayers are in the Psalms, right? We, don't, we, never, we never do them in church. We never read that Psalm in church. I hope you kill my enemies and they have terrible days of it. That's, but that's in the Bible. Why? Why? Because, because David knew he did something that Miroslav Volf calls this. It's called the theologization of violence. And it's this. It's you ask God to do it and then you don't. Right? Thank you. She's tracking, man. She's on it. You're like... It's called the theologization of violence. So I am gonna pray. See, some of you, you've not, you, would, you would never pray a prayer like that, but that's in the Bible, right? Some of you are like at work, you're like, oh, you hate Tom. Tom's being a jerk. Tom's taking all the jobs. And, and, and you know, Jesus told you to pray for Tom, pray for your enemies, but he never told you what to pray. <laughs> you can pray, oh, Tom, I just pray Tom's weekend is awful and that his teeth fall out and get hit by a rock in his face and his whole family doesn't like him anymore, Lord. Right? Why? So, so that you won't do that to Tom. That's the point. Jesus Christ absorbs all the evil and violence on the cross so that we don't have to do it to anybody anymore. That's why Romans 12 says you can return evil with good. And when you return evil with good, then the next chapter is all about how God will do vengeance. The only reason you don't do vengeance is because you know that God will. And so Jesus is like, God, he already knows. He already knows. So it's gonna change you. The second thing though is prayer is gonna change things. It's gonna change you and it's gonna change things. It's gonna change the world because prayer is you tapping into something that is supernatural. We live, we live a life on a natural plane most days where we do things and they have results and that's the natural world. Prayer all thins the veil between you and God and the supernatural world and things start to happen in your life if you listen that never would have been able to happen if it was just you. Have you had these things in your life where something goes down? Like, like um, I remember, um, I'll share, share a couple of instances. I remember my 
family uh, wanted my girls, all, this was five or six years ago, they said, Dad, we really have a heart for Uganda, Africa. We wanna like somehow get there, go on mission there, it'd be great. And I was like, we don't have any money to do this. And so uh, my wife and I are like, okay, well, let's do a pizza and prayer night. So order some pizza, sit down in the living room, and we'll just pray. So that's what we did. So we said, girls, this is the one prayer thing, and we just started to pray. What about Uganda? What about missions work? Blah, blah, blah. Amen. Great. Move on with our life. A week later, no joke, I get a phone call from a guy. He's like, hey, Pastor Mark, I was just out with this guy for lunch, and we were chatting, and he owns a mission organization in Uganda, Africa. And we, as we talked over lunch, we thought, you know what would be really great? Getting the Clark girls exposed to some missionary work in Uganda, Africa. So we want to pay for you and your whole family to go over there for two weeks. <laughs> what? How is that possible? What are the statistical odds that somebody, and, and this happens, I mean, I remember uh, I was a 20-year-old intern at a church before I planted my own church. I was a 20-year-old intern. I was sitting up in my office and I was playing Minesweeper. Remember, remember that game Minesweeper, right, on the computer, right? I was just like dot, 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 dot. And the secretary comes up. She's like, hey, there's a woman here and she was driving past the church and she wants to talk to a pastor. I'm like, well, go get one then, dot, 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 dot. And she's like, no, no, you're, you're the only pastor in. I'm like, well, I'm an intern, what are you talking about? So I go downstairs and I sit with her and she goes, Pastor Mark, here's the thing, I'll drive by the church and, and I, I cheat on my husband and it's gonna destroy our family and I need to know what to do. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. So I just said, can I pray for you? And I just started to pray. And I'm telling you right now, this has never happened to me since. I started to get pictures of things in her life as clear as day and just started praying them. Hey, da, 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 this happened. And then the kid's gonna do this. And then this happened with this person. And this, 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 da, da, da. amen. And she's bawling and she looked up and she said, how do you know all this? And I'm like, I was, I was just a minesweeper. I was just. <laughs> this is what God does is if you start tapping in, he starts giving you things that other people need. And the question is, do you have like the courage? Some of you are bored with Christianity. The reason you're bored is because you're playing some suburban safe version of it. If you are bored with Christianity, here's what I would say. Go out to Starbucks this afternoon, sit down in a chair and say, God, give me something for some random stranger in this Starbucks and I will walk up to them and I will tell them what you told me and then see how bored you are. You're bored because you're living some suburban, nonsensical, totally gutted version of Christianity where you have no risk and need no courage. It's safe for the whole family. Come to our church, everything's safe. And the songs are safe. Everything's safe. No one calls you to anything. This is what we, but if you listen and you have the courage to do, okay, so um, here's what happened to me six months ago. Guy calls me up, he says, hey, I want you to come to my church in San Francisco and preach. I'm like, perfect, that's great, San Francisco's nice. And he goes, here's what I want you to do. I want you to preach on gender. <laughs> what? In, so you want me to come preach on gender? He's like, I want you, you to preach on the biblical version of gender in San Francisco. <laughs> and I'm like, man, can we do something like less controversial, like, the end times or politics or something where I can just get up and like <laughs> tell you who you should vote for, like something just a little bit down. And he's like, no, nope, gender. And I'm like, oh man, all right. So I prep, work super hard on this sermon. I'm like reading all these psychologists and all these gender philosophies and all this kind of stuff. And I was reading this, this, this doctor who actually comes out of San Francisco and University of California, Dr. Luann Brizendine. And she wrote this book about the female brain. And she talks about how the female brain versus the male brain, and how there are difference between boys and girls in utero, the man, the, the, the woman uh, brain floods with estrogen. And so it enhances all the communication ability between the, the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And that's why women can multitask. But in utero, in a male, testosterone floods their brain and testosterone, it just kills all the communication between the left and right hemisphere. And so it just, it just fills with sex and aggression, sex and aggression. And so that's why, they open the fridge and they're like, honey, it's not here. And she like just goes, around, boom, you idiot. And she can like multitask and figure everything out. A woman is very complex and it's clear and it's a ton of communication and men are just like, trying to get through. And so 
they did this study where they put little boys and little girls in these rooms. And so they put all the little girls in a room and they had fire trucks and guns and they would watch them. And in 10 minutes, these little girls would pick up the fire truck and they would wrap it in a blanket and they would start rocking it to sleep and raising this fire truck as a child. And then they'd put the little boys in the room and the little boys would have a bunch of dolls and within 10 minutes, they're like, <laughs> you ready to <laughs> get out of here, you're in my tribe. Uh, so, so Dr. Lou and Brizendine did all this work. So I was talking about that. But then I was like, what's really cool though, is while these things might be stitched into nature, the biblical presentation actually isn't that uh, polarized all the time. It has, it has these nuances where these, these archetypes of men and women are more nuanced in the biblical story. For instance, David, David as a man. When is he a man? When he's fighting Goliath or when he's sitting out with his little guitar writing poetry in a field? It's both. And then I said, and I don't know why I wrote this down. I was like, and what is a woman biblically? Well, a woman can keep a home like First Peter talks about or man, she could be Deborah. And Deborah was the leader. She was a judge of Israel. And in the Old Testament, she would lead. A na- so I said, yeah, when, when is a woman more a woman? When she's keeping a home or when she's leading a nation to war, right? And I'm like, okay. So I wrote this down. I'm like, I don't know. So I get there to this church in San Francisco and I sit in the front row. It's eight o'clock in the morning, just before the first service. And the pastor looks at us. He goes, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Condoleezza Rice goes to our church. I'm like, what? What do you mean Condoleezza Rice goes to our church? I'm like, this sermon would have been so much better had I known Condoleezza Rice. Now, for those of you, she's Secretary of State in the White House for eight years, like lives down in San Francisco, does all the school. She's a professor, brilliant doctor. I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have honed this thing in. This thing would have been tight. It would have been awesome. And now I'm like up there. And so I'm like, I'm, so I'm up there preaching. And I'm talking about men and women and how it floods their brain and this and that and the fridge and, da, and there's a kid and, and there's a kid and there's a kid and, da, da, da. and I said, when, when is a man more a man? When he's out fighting uh, Goliath or when he's at home playing his little thing and he's writing poetry. And when is a woman more a woman? And in that moment, I realized this was for her. And she was sitting third row. When is a woman more a woman? When she's sitting at home keeping a house or when she's leading a nation to war? And I look at her third row and she's like, "Mm mm-hmm. All right, and I'm just like, (laughs) I got no idea why God put this one sentence in my brain and it was for one person sitting in the crowd that needed. So anyway, Condi and I were chatting the other day and we're like, hey. (laughs) We're like emailing about stuff, it was fine. (laughs) But sometimes... God gives you something for one person. And the question is, prayer is the thing that's gonna make you convinced that you can go walk in it. When we, uh, as a church, we had, we were locked down for a year and a half in Canada during COVID. And all I did was preach to the camera for a year and a half. And uh, so people started to get pretty depressed and pretty, you know, just frustrated. And so, I remember this, this one particular Sunday, I was preaching to the camera, just me and the cameraman, and I'm preaching my sermon, and I realized this line sentence came into my head that I'd never thought about before, and I just said it. I said, you know, you know, God not only loves you, but he likes you too. He created you, and he likes you, and some of you need to know that. And even as I said it, I was like, I don't know what that line means. Like, it's not really me. It feels a little soft, right, it's sentimental. God likes you. And he, I was like, okay. So I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. It just popped into my head. I just said it. So I'm like, hey, ship it, sermon played. Three days later, I get an email from a woman. She said, my 15-year-old son and I have been super depressed during COVID. And here's the thing, we're done with the church. And we said, this is the last church service we're gonna watch. And my son looked to me as we turned it on, no joke. And the son says this, you know, I'm kind of over being told that God loves me, I wish someone would look at me one day and tell me that he likes me as well. I'm not joking you. That's crazy. What are the, this is what, guys, look look at the end of this passage. Look what he says. He says, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So you have a father and and he's good and prayer isn't this safe 
Eugene Peterson says, sometimes people ask pastors, hey, pastor, can you offer up a little prayer? And Eugene Peterson says, there's no such thing as little prayers. Prayer enters the lion's den and you're not sure whether you're going to escape alive or sane. You have a father who's moving and doing things and our response is to be in contact with him so that then we can move and do what he's telling us to do. But we have a father and he's good. And some of you, you need to just hear in Christianity, you get a good father, a good one. He doesn't exist. He's not just powerful. He's not just perfect. He's actually really good. And the reason some of you need to hear that is because you're like me. My dad left my family when I was eight years old. He died when I was 15 and he never even told me he was sick. He died without ever giving his son the ability to say goodbye to him. That's what kind of father I had. But when I met Jesus, I actually got a good father. I got a father who hunts me down, loves me, does things. I remember uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I, we were driving up to um, speak at this marriage conference. And we're driving up and we got three days to teach on marriage. And so we're driving up. And we're in the car and my wife says to me, she says, hey, so what are we gonna talk about at this marriage conference? And I said, well, let me do the teaching and you chime in every once in a while, right? Now, yeah, that's, it sounded really good in my head when I, when I thought it, but the minute I said it, I was like, ah, so no, 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 no. right? I just wanna grab those words and like, that's not what I meant, honey, you're a genius. But I said, oh, I'll just chime in every once in a while. So she's like, what? So she goes, Bruh, and she goes silent on me and just stares out the window of our car and just like, she's done. So I'm driving, I'm like, oh man, because this is what happens. When you got to go away and teach on marriage, here's what happens. Your marriage sucks. So now she's looking out the window, give me the silent treatment. I'm driving, I'm like trying to chat with her. She won't chat with me. I'm asking her questions. She's not responding. And I'm like, oh man. So I did something that I hadn't done in at least a decade. I've, I'm like Spotify generation. I choose my albums. I choose my songs. I choose what I want. I wasn't in the mood for that. I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to turn on the radio, man. The old school 1980s radio. Like hit a button and laser beams come out of the sky into a pole in the front of your car and just play whatever. So I did that. And I'm not kidding you. This is not a joke. The first song that comes out of the radio is the song that we danced to on our wedding night. Right? This, was, this is how good God is, guys. Like if you don't believe in God and you're here, what are the statistical odds? 300 million songs in the world. He, he plays right through the radio and he's like, come on, guys. I'm trying to get your attention, right? Baby, you're all that I want. When I'm lying there in your arms, right? And this is it. I'm finding it hard to believe we're in heaven, right? And I'm like, gosh, and I'm picturing, I'm, I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry, baby. This is, this is how good God is, guys. He reaches, he said, like, come on, guys, I want you back together. The first song out of 100 million songs, he plays the one that's gonna heal us. That's how good he is. Now, I see my wife's arm just come from her side and go boop and shut off the radio. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's exactly what happened. But listen, at least God tried. He tried. He did his best, man. This woman's heart is cold. He's so good. Guys, he's so good. That's what he does. He gives you, he gives you songs. He gives you people. He gives you moments. He gives you a word. He lets you decide what you're going to do with that. You can either be cold to it and shut it down, or you can actually listen to it and respond to it. But even you being here right now, even you being here right now, and I'll, I'll end with this and then pray for you. Even you being here right now, how did that happen? Do you know why? Because every single one of you is a product of someone praying. That's what it is. There are no accidents. There's no coincidences. You're not here because you fumbled in here. If you go back in your brain and you think about the million things that had to happen for you to be here right now, the million things that had to happen with this person, had to meet that person, had to meet that person, had to do this, and then they pour into my life, and here I am. It's a grace that you're here. It's an absolute grace. Listen, the only reason I'm standing on the stage right now, the only reason I'm a Christian, I am the result of the prayers of one man, my grandfather. My grandfather was the only other Christian in my family. He died last year at 100 years old. 
100 years old, only other Christian in my family. And he prayed for me long before I was ever born. And the reason he ever became a Christian, his family weren't Christians, he didn't hear about Jesus until he was about 25 years old. So do the math in your brain, 75 years ago, my grandfather is driving on a highway in Toronto on his way to work in the morning. He's driving his car, and as he's driving, his engine gives out, and his car starts to shudder, and he needs to pull off the road, and he pulls off on the first exit that he can, and he kind of clamors in to a gas station, a mechanic shop, and the mechanic walks out, and he said, I don't know what to do, my car's broken, and the mechanic comes out from the back, he says, give me an hour. He fixes my grandfather's engine, he goes back in, he calls my grandfather, says, fix your car. Says, my grandfather says, okay, listen, I don't have any money, but I'll come back tomorrow and I'll pay you. And this guy says, don't worry about paying me. Here's your payment. I want you to come with me tonight, downtown Toronto, to Maple Leaf Gardens, because down there, there's a man who's talking about some really important stuff, and I want you to hear it. And my grandfather's like, okay, whatever. So he, the guy picks him up, and they go all the way down to Maple Leaf Gardens, and they, there's a circle around this building and they stand in line and they go in. My grandfather gets like the top chair at the top level of Maple Leaf Gardens and this man walks out and preaches the gospel. And he tells him, you are sinners, you are made in the image of God, but you are sinners, there's nothing you could do to earn your way to God. And so Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross and he absorbed the wrath of God and he took your sin in your place and he rose again from death to give you life and if you repent right now and you come forward and you give your life to Jesus, he will give you eternal life. And my grandfather, with tears in his eyes, walked forward and gave his life to Jesus that night. And that man's name was Billy Graham. Billy Graham. He didn't know him from Adam. So why am I here? Because 75 years ago on some random road at some particular moment in time, right beside the most perfect exit you could imagine, my grandfather's engine decided to die. And then God took that death and brought life out of it. And every single one of you that is here is a result of somebody praying that you would know Jesus, that you would know his grace. You are not an accident. You are not in these seats by an accident. A million and one things had to happen for you to be here. And God is like reaching out and he's talking to you and he's speaking to you. And the question is, do you listen? Do you go yes? Or do you go, ah, I shut myself off to this. I don't know about this. And so I just pray for us right now. Father in heaven, I wanna do what Jesus taught us to do in this moment. Prayer is not some quaint thing that we do at the end of a church service. It is literally us talking to the God of the universe, connecting with you, communing with you, speaking to you about our cares and our fears and our desires. And I pray in this moment that we aren't distracted by the things of our life, but we would just have a minute if there are people in this room that have never given their lives to you, like my grandfather, like me when I was 18 years old, that they would right now just have the courage to just pray to just pray and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart, come into my life. I believe in you, your death and your resurrection on my behalf in this moment, on this day, I've been fighting it. I turn from my sin and I receive the gift of your Holy Spirit right now in this moment. I want new life eternal life in you. Guys, there's only two kinds of people in this world, forgiven and unforgiven. And if you just prayed that prayer, heaven is rejoicing because you are now forgiven. And then for those of us maybe who have accepted Christ already, but are wrestling and struggling, not only with a prayer life, but a life of power at all, I pray in this moment, today might be a reset and we might feel you, Lord and walk out a hair renewed with our eyes fixed on you. Knowing you have put us where you've put us for such a time as this and called us to great things, not safe things, but great things to your glory. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen.